It's me, Undead Viking. I am here to talk to you about a game that I have been excited about for a very, very, very long time. Uh, I got contacted, um, well, I don't remember when it was, but it was quite a long time ago. I got an email uh, with somebody telling me about Seventh Continent, and uh, that's the name of the game, and, uh, and, and describing the game to me. And... Um, asking me uh, many months in advance if I'd be interested in doing uh, this Kickstarter video for them. And uh, I, after they described the game uh, a little bit to me, I was like, yes, please. Um, uh, basically, uh, the game is uh, kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure uh, type of situation. And but I don't think that really does it justice. I think a lot of us read the Choose Your Adventure books uh, back when we were younger. And I remember I read a bunch of them, and my daughter reads them now. And and but the games that the books that uh, kind of uh, came after the fact, and they referenced this in the email they sent me, um, was uh, the fighting fantasy books. Now, if you grew up in the era, the heyday era of Steve Jackson games before they became the uh, the, the the company that makes Munchkin. Um, uh, Steve Jackson Games had like a ton of crazy cool ideas that they had. A lot of different RPGs and a lot of different little box games and things like that. And, uh, and one of the things they had was they published these fighting fantasy books. And, and the fighting fantasy books uh, were basically a choose your own adventure, but it told you to create a, a, a adventurer beforehand. It was like kind of a rudimentary D&D uh, &D character. And you would, they would have uh, stats, and and they would have powers, and, and what have you, and then uh, you would, you know, open up the book, and you started just like a choose your own adventure book. But the big difference was is that you had like a character sheet, and as you played, you kept track of things that you had, and kept track of your stats, and kept track of of like places you had been, and things like that. And and so what would happen is is that the game, the book would tell you. Uh, oh, okay, so you've run into a goblin, and then you'd, like, fight the goblin, you know, like, by rolling dice or whatever. And, like, if he did, took some damage, you'd, you'd write that down, and then you'd move on to the next one. And you move on to, like, going down. But it wasn't just fighting, either. There were a lot of puzzles and things like that. And there was situations where, like, at the beginning of the book, if you hadn't, you know, like, investigated uh, the old man's hut and, and found... Um, you know, the, the the silver key that he hid in the fireplace, you know, like, three hours later, <laughs> when, for whatever reason, you're, you're like, in the, the dungeon, and uh, there's, like, this little tiny uh, silver box that, that has uh, the, the, the gem that you need. If you hadn't gotten that silly silver key uh, and wrote, written it down, you wouldn't be able to do anything, because the game would actually be clever, too, and it would say, um, you know, the, when you found the silver key, it told you what it, there was a number on it. Uh, go to that number, uh, that that page number on this book, and then read what happens. And I guess you could have cheated or whatever, but it was stuff like that that really made uh, the, the, the adventure and stuff come to life. And so when they described this to me, and they basically said, this is going to be like a totally open world adventure where you're allowed to pretty much kind of wander around and do what you want, but also, um, you know, it's going to take... Like, you're not going to be able to play it all at once. This is something where it's going to take several, several, several sessions and and multiple hours and, like, you know, hundreds of hours of gameplay um, just to just to solve the mysteries and solve the, the plans. I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds absolutely amazing. And I was very excited about it. And so I got... Um, <laughs> Let me show you something. So when I got it, it was like in a, in a, a, a package or whatever, and I was so excited. I, I I took out a scissors and I cut up cut up the top of the envelope, and I I actually like cut the top of my my rule book off uh, of my my uh, my seventh continent book. But whatever. So I, I did that and like and I got the base set and I set it up, and um, I couldn't wait for my friends to come over. I couldn't wait for my gaming group, so I just played it solo. And I'll be honest with you, I played this one solo mostly. I have played it with some of my friends. We've kind of done done the cooperative development of, his, of it as well, but I've mostly um, investigated this introductory island adventure, if you will, um, on my own and, and, and plumbed the secrets and eventually solved it. And I, I remember feeling a great sense of accomplishment uh, when I pulled it off. So um, 
I mean, the game's amazing, and the game's awesome. I'll talk more about that uh, when I get to the conclusion. But let me show you uh, how uh, to play the game. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to try to show you everything, because I don't want to. I want you to experience that. About Well, anyway, I'll explain that uh, in, in the gameplay. But um, So I'll show you how the game plays. Uh, the, the, the mechanisms are, are, are pretty, pretty simple, and but, but they are really, really interesting. So... And the game itself is just like a really, really interesting. It's a nice little puzzle box that gets opened as you play. But uh, okay, so here's how to play uh, Seventh Continent, and then we'll come back here and I'll talk more uh, about the game. All right, this is Seventh Continent. I'm just going to kind of show you how to play the game. This is going to be a little weird uh, because I want to show you how the game works, uh, but I don't want to delve too much into it due to the fact that this is kind of like a mystery game, as I said. And uh, once the mystery is solved, I mean, there really isn't a lot of reason to go back and do it again unless there was like some uh, avenue that you didn't try and you just want to give it a shot. But I don't want to ruin the game for anybody, so I'm going to show you real basic bones of, of the system just so I, I don't give away too much because uh, I've played this uh, you know a couple times with my buddies and I've actually just watched other people play it uh, just to kind of see their reaction to it because it is kind of fun to see that and uh, and to kind of like just watch other people explore the game after I've kind of fully explored it myself so uh, there's several different decks of cards that you see in front of you here um, just quickly uh, uh, th these are the random event cards and I'm gonna show you how all this stuff works but just going to tell you what these are. These are the random event cards. Uh, these are the food cards. When you uh, manage to find food by capturing an animal or what have you, uh, you'll get a food card. And the food cards are good because they uh, prolong uh, the, the, the game. Um, they allow you to return cards from the discard pile uh, to the main deck, and I'll explain that in a little bit as well. Uh, you have uh, this shoulder bag. Uh, there's one of these cards. Uh, the shoulder bag will tell you, um, it has this little icon here with this book, so whenever you find anything that has a book icon, it's a note, and it goes into the shoulder bag, and everybody has access to this. And it also tells you, depending on the number of players, um, what you have access to as far as the number of cards that you can have in your hand. You can see that listed here. Like, so four, um, you know, green bonus, four, uh, idea cards, 3-3, three, three, and so on and so forth, and also it tells you how many items you can have. So with like three players, uh, you can have two items that can be composed of three separate items. So that's a little a little confusing, but I'll explain that also in just a few moments. Um, but so like, and in in you get this one to start with. This is the curse. Um, the curse is the the, the voracious goddess, and uh, the curse is it's like it tells you a little background. Since you returned from the expedition, the vision of a strange, glooming idol calling you in your sleep has been haunting your nights. Among the notes taken by your companions, you come across a sheet where something that looks like a route was drawn along with several statues as it happens. One of the statues looks just like the one from your restless dreams. And so it actually, like, and so then there's this little path here. I'm not going to really go into that too much, but nothing is shown on any card in this game that does not have a purpose or a story behind it. It's one of the things about the game that I really, really enjoy. So uh, here's these uh, three character. Um, you know, I'm just showing this. These are the three that I got with this, uh, this, this like, kind of really, really bare-bones version of the game that I got. Each person has a name, uh, they have a backstory that's on the back, and um, they have a special ability. And usually the special ability just allows them to, to avoid certain effects, like um, the, the Ferdinand here, um, he can discard uh, two uh, items, or uh, or like ideas cards with the keyword of stealth. All cards have like a keyword on the bottom, like this one says explore. But the keyword of stealth, to change an action, you have to perform. If you ever see an action that has this red border around it, it means you have to do it. And change it into something that you can choose to perform, so you aren't forced to. Uh, so, and then uh, Keelan McCluskey, the same thing, if you can discard the keyword of will to ignore the consequence step of your action. Uh, if you do, you must immediately take this action again. So if she does an action, something bad happens, she can try again immediately. And here we have Dimitri, just to give you all three. Uh, when you get a red state card, those are these right there, uh, you may discard two, the same thing, with the keyword aggressiveness. If you do, you do not discard any cards from the action deck. So each person is going to get one of these, and they're just going to put it in front of them, and that'll be their character. 
Um, since we just talked about the state cards, I might as well just talk about that really briefly. Uh, these are when something bad happens to you. You know, you can try your hardest, but things are going to happen. You can get tired. You can get injured. You can become paranoid. Uh, and so there's these different like states that you can have. These are bad. Normally, what happens is if you draw one, you take it, and then it has some sort of effect on you, and it's just like you're tired. You know, you're just exhausted. You're, you're tired. Oh, you're tired. And then this little thing down here, it tells you what you need to do uh, to, like, return this to the back so you're not tired anymore. Well, you can see this doesn't really have a negative effect on you. You're just tired. However, if you get another state card, you look at how many cards you already have as far as state cards are, and you have to discard those out of the action deck, and that's a bad thing, which I'm going to explain to you in just a little bit. But, so you're always, when you have these, you're going to try to get rid of them. So, like, if you're injured... You know, it says, you know, oh, you know, pretty gruesome injury. Um, you know, you can, like, try uh, a first aid attempt. And then you can try to return this to back. And then, so, uh, if it happens, then you, you know, it gets more intense. Randomly discard an idea card from your hand if you fail at it. And finally, the paranoid ones, and these are kind of interesting. Uh, paranoid happens when you are in the same spot as somebody else. And you all work together to try to succeed at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a job or a, an investigation or whatever as the game uh, presents itself to you. And if you fail, it, it represents the kind of mistrust that you have with the other players. And so the only way you get paranoid is if your character is alone on a terrain card, you can get rid of it. So they get, they, they're by themselves and they can, you know, then not be worried about somebody else like going to steal anything from them or ruin their day or what have you. So you don't want to get those in your hand. Uh, you can't ever get multiple ones of the same. So like if you had a tired and a paranoid card and you get another paranoid card, you'd still discard those two cards, but you don't get another paranoid card in your hand. You always, you only have one of each state. So, and then these are, uh, these are, these are uh, experience point cards. Certain, certain actions and certain successes will tell you to collect these. And I'm not going to show you these just because they have little tips and tricks on there that, that you'll learn as you play the game. I don't want to give those away. But as you collect those, uh, then you get experience. And, you'll, and as you, if you get enough, uh, you can start adding cards um, to the, the action deck that are going to give you advanced abilities and things like that. All right. So... There you go. Um, I'm just going to show you one food card really quick. So, like, here's uh, a fish or a mollusk. And then it says if you can randomly take four cards, five, if you have a fire resource, meaning that you, you've built a fire, um, from the discard and shuffle them back into the action deck. And then you return that. So you've eaten that, you've gained some strength back, and then you can put some cards back in the action deck. All right, so enough of that. I'm going to show you the very first card off the top of the deck. These cards are numbered, I should say. These are like the, the, the adventure deck, basically. And so these cards have numbers on the top, just like all of your old uh, Choose Your Adventure books that you may or may not have read at a young age. And, uh, and so you're going to take the top one, and then you read this aloud to everybody at the table. Uh, the piercing cries of a few gulls pull you from a deep sleep. It feels so strange. It sounds like they are laughing. A few feet away, thick plumes of yellowish smoke escape from the volcanic rock. You try to understand where on earth are you? How did you end up at this place? You cannot seem to remember. So, ooh, mysterious, right? So you flip it over, and then here's the opening spot on the board. I'm just going to kind of show uh, what all of this is. So um, you can, uh, you can see that there's, there's like all of these things that are here, like these little numbers here are going to direct you. If you go in that direction, you're going to collect that card and you're going to put it and you're going to experience that card. The same thing goes for here. Now this card, this is like, go check this out. This is like, go look and see what's on there. There's this really good um, reference here that, that shows all those different possibilities. And so, like, if you see um, here, go and see or visit is what that icon says right there. And so what you have here is that, you know, as you land, you have these options. You can go and see and visit. You can try to go and move, the, move those directions. Now, the, the things that are interesting is this will tell you what kind of terrain you're on right here. You're in rocky terrain. Now, um, if you have a situation that will say, if you're in rocky terrain, draw this card or something like that. That's what you check. This right here says that slate or like is available. And if you get an item that will allow you to 
build something if you have like available like this this slate or this rock then you you know you're in this spot and you can do that this isn't something you collect there's no there's no resources of this type that you put in front of you you have to be in this spot then you can collect that particular thing and you have access to it finally down here this one and then this zero if you want to travel to this spot from another location you have to discard one action card to be able to go into this spot. Now notice how it says one plus, you are allowed to discard more cards on these if you want to. And I don't know why you'd want to unless, because they're in some cases you have to just so you can actually pull off a success. Notice how there's zero on these stars, it takes zero successes to successfully move. So there really wouldn't be any reason, but due to the fact that when I show you here how you would actually handle um, that process, uh, you get to keep one of the idea cards that you use when you attempt to do that. And so then, you know, that's kind of the case here. So what happens is, is you're going to go ahead and place that down like so. So you've gone ahead and this is the opening spot. Now, the island's going to get a lot bigger than the area that you're going to see in front of you. So I've just kind of, you know, left by, uh, this open area. And I'm not going to show you much of the island. I don't want to give, like I said, I don't want to give away too much of this introductory adventure. I want you guys to experience it yourself. So what happens here is that you're going to go ahead and you're going to place, these are the random encounters, and whenever you see this particular icon, it tells you Roman numeral 1, here's the Roman numeral 1, and you're going to place those face up in those spots, like so. And so those in the location. So now we're going to take all three of the players, so we're going to put those right there, and so they're on that spot on the board. Now. What happens is, is that if somebody decides they're going to investigate those spots, you're going to notice how, once again, it says, this, this icon here means find a path. It takes no uh, cards to turn over and no successes. So you can just flip it over and you're going to experience the random event that's underneath this. And then it says return this after you flip it over because you're going to experience it and you're going to see what's happening. So what happens in this situation, so the game's started. Now, theoretically, none of you have played the game before, and you're, you've got an open, wide sandbox of a situation where you're going to be like, you have no idea what's going on, or you're just going to be investigating this island. You just landed on See, I've done this adventure. I know exactly what's going on, so I, I'm trying not to give anything away. But So you're on this adventure. You have no idea what's going on. You're just here. And the only thing you can do is you can start investigating things. And so this isn't a situation where each person gets one turn and you keep going around. This is a situation where everybody in cooperatively, and it, or so if you're obviously playing solo, you can choose whatever you want. But cooperatively, what you're going to do is you're going to decide, you know, it's like, okay, what should we do? And one player is going to say, well, I think we should do this. I should do this. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to head north. I'm going to see what's up there. I'm going to head west. I'm going to see. And the other player will say, well, I'm going to go and see, you know, what's over here. Go and see in that little spot. And then you just take your turns. Like one person will just do their thing. You, you experience it. The next person does theirs and so on and so forth. And so I'm going to show you a couple of things. We're going to show you the go and see. And I'm going to show you what happens when you move into a location. So say it's the blue player's turn. And they say... I'm going to go west, I'm going to see what's in this direction. And so what they're going to do, actually, you know what? <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to say we go north. So uh, so we're going to go north, and so what happens is you take this card, and you're going to flip it over, and you're going to see what the, see what the, uh, the finding a path does. So we flip it over, and we see tune. And so it says, a lukewarm breeze coming from the west brings str strange metallic sounds. However uncomfortable this place is, you start feeling sleepy. So, with this action, this is these are the actions. The white border things are actions. And that is a rest action. So you can see that there is their rest action. So if I had a tired state, it says for, you, know, you turn over no cards, but you can return your tired state. Reorganize the top three cards of the action deck as you wish, if, if you do it. Discard this. Uh, the ground is definitely too rough. Discard this. Now, the thing is, is that you don't have to do this. Notice how it says zero cards. You always, if there's a number there, you have to draw those cards. But in this situation, you don't have to if you don't want to, due to the fact that you don't, you know, you you have. You, I'm not tired, so we're just gonna, like, for whatever reason that didn't happen. You know, we heard the noise, but it didn't affect us. So we're gonna discard that random event, and then this tells us to draw number seven. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna find number seven. Now, a couple things about drawing cards out of this deck. Here's number seven, we're gonna draw that here, but I wanna show you something really quick. So some cards, there's multiples of. See how there's two nines here? 
when it says draw nine, you're going to draw one of those randomly without looking at it. You're going to pick one. And sometimes you have a situation where you have a 12 and you have a gold 12. Unless the game tells you to draw this, you have to draw the green ones first. You can't draw the yellow cards uh, first. So you just keep, keep that in mind. So anyway, so this tells us to draw number seven. So we're going to draw number seven, like so. We're going to go ahead and put this deck down. And then we're going to reveal. So we turn, we see this. Further to the north, the terrain slopes down to the level of the water. So we flip this over, and what do we see? We see, you know, greater, dest you know, like a lot more, uh, uh, like, places we can explore, see how it hooks up. And like I said, nothing in this game, in the picture, is there for no reason. Just keep that in mind. So you can kind of take a look at the whole thing, and you can kind of say, well, what's, what's that over there? Looks like a dead body. Well, hmm, we can go check that out. And there's some, like, reefs over here. We can check that out as well. And also, once again, it is rocky, and it has a 1. We have to use an action card to move into this location. So we place that down. Now, the person who just explored that, they want to head north, they can, if they want, immediately move into that spot by doing that. And what they'll do then is they will turn an action card over, and it's an idea card. They turn it over, and here, I'll just show you what this looks like. Now, if this had needed a star to succeed, there's a star over on this side. That's a good thing. Now, plus, there's where there's a will, there's a way. Discard this to apply the immediate effect. Draw three additional cards, taking their successes into account. Now, remember what I said, how like there's a number on there that says you have to draw that many? Sometimes you'll have a situation where it says... It's like a, one card and you need a single star. But you're going to turn this over you're not going to get any of these starred successes over here and it isn't going to work. So if you have this card in your hand, you're allowed to play one idea card. Uh, each person that's involved in the event. Now if I had said, hey, you, know, you two, why don't you come with me when I move north? They can move with me at the same time. We can all go and travel at the same time. It doesn't have to be one by one and burn through cards that way. But in this situation, we're splitting up. Maybe it's foolish. Who knows? But so... If I had this, or somebody else had this, and we were doing something, we could play this, and we could draw three more cards out of that deck, which isn't a good thing, because I'll explain that in just a little bit, because that deck is basically your life. But if you're going to fail at something that you really need to succeed at, you could use this card as an idea card. So you take that card, and you're going to put that in your hand. Remember that the maximum number of cards with the three players we can have, we can have three blue idea cards in our hand. And now I'm in that spot. So, the next thing that's going to happen is, like, let's say um, the, the yellow player, you know, decides they're going to go ahead and investigate um, that spot that says, you know, go and see. And that takes one card. So, once again, we're going to turn that card over. And this is a curse card. Now, this one isn't um, necessarily a bad thing. There are a certain number of these curse cards in there, but... Nothing happens. Now, this, this could have been way worse because we just had to turn a card over, and this has obviously no successes on it, but we didn't need a success. This is actually kind of good that this happened. So we're going to take this curse card, and we're going to go ahead and put it in the discard pile, which we're just going to have that right next to it. And then we're going to go ahead, and we're going to draw number five and see what happens here. So we have, look, we have a five that is uh, green and five that is gold. And so we don't get the gold one yet, and so we're going to go ahead and draw the green one. And the green one says, you stand before a nearly 50 foot high rocky hill. So we turn this over and it says the view from up there must be quite interesting. And so it actually has on here a test, a climb test, where it says that we can draw one or more cards if you want and you get like two, you have to get two successes to successfully do it. But notice this icon, when we do that it means that we can replace this card with the yellow card or the gold card of the same number. But if you fail at that attempt, here's what happens. You fall to the uh, the stony ground below, all characters involved get injured. So obviously that's not a good thing. Now this is a permanent fixture of the board and we're going to go ahead and place that right there. What this means is when we're in this spot we can activate this location. It, you don't have to move onto here to do it. When you are in the this spot here, you can take any of the actions that are on that terrain, any of the permanent ones, the permanent like fixtures that are in those spots. 
And also, uh, you can do like any actions that are on item cards that you have or anything like that. So, you know, th that's your option as far as, you know, what you can do. So now we have a situation where there's a couple of interesting things that have happened. You know, we have this, this cool little hill, and it says basically if we climb up there, we could probably see something really cool. And then plus we have this dead body up there. So the, the red character is going to say, well, you know what, I'm going to try to climb up there. You know, and, and I, I, I'm going to, now, now, theoretically, later on in the game, it might be easier uh, because of the fact that we don't have any items, we don't have any rope or anything like that, some things that you can actually find, that will be able to help us succeed at this attempt, but the red player is going to try. And they're going to say, you know what, it's going to, it says one plus cards to get two successes, but I want to, I, I want to make sure that I get up there, so I'm going to discard, you know, three cards or four cards. So, and the other players might say, well, I don't think you should do that. And then you have a discussion or whatever, but you're going to hope for the best here. And so the red player is going to try to do that. We, we grab three cards. We're going to turn them over. And we're going to fail <laughs> because we needed two successes. Now, I want you to see something here. See these two uh, uh, stars right there? They're half stars. You might think, oh, it's two half stars. That's a success. Unfortunately, that isn't a success. So in this situation, we'd have one and a half stars. Now, if the red player had any cards in their hand that they could play uh, that would give them a bonus, like, you know, maybe if, like, this player had gone along, um, you know, like, they'd be able to turn this card over and play it, and they'd be have, like, this plus three, but they're not with us right now. And so what's going to happen is, because you fail, they're going to take that injured result, and so they're going to go through. Now, because he got injured, he doesn't have any state cards in his hand yet. So, at this point, nothing technically bad has happened. You're going to take this injured card and put it down. Now, I'm just going to, I'm going to dig through here and I'm going to find something. I want to show you how this works, just so you can kind of see it. Uh, oh, okay, so here you go. So, if we had gotten, like, this card with, so let's say, we got these cards at the time. What you can do is you can actually combine these two like so, and you can see then we have the two stars that we need. And then plus, we have these three cards that you're gonna be able to choose from to try to take something. Now, I just wanna show you these, because these are item cards. I wanna show you how these work. So you get to take one of these idea cards. So you can see that this is a walking stick. The walking stick will help movement, which is good, and also can be used to fight, which is also good. And it, and any time you use the walking stick, you get to decrease the number of cards that you have to turn over by two. This is really good for moving. So you have to, if you take this card or this idea card, you'd have to use a build action that would take two cards, just discarding two. It doesn't take any successes to pull it off. And you'd just be able to, tra you'd have this in your hand, but then you would transfer it over and it would become an item. When it becomes an item, you will take one of these D6s and I'm, I, and you see that number is four in there, you would go ahead and put the four on there. Every time you use this for one of these six things, you'd reduce the durability by one. When this die gets down to zero, you would get rid of the item and you would no longer have your walking stick. But like I said, because it has a minus two, you know, for either of these two actions, it's obviously very, very good. And you don't have to notice how like there's this this stick here. If you end up in a in a spot that has a resource that has that stick, it takes minus two cards to make basically saying you can make it for nothing. Now I'm just gonna show you here, like here's rope. And rope, you know, it would take three cards to build, and minus three if you're in the spot that has that those items. That, that help you. They have, and this is very important, these are a couple of things, and I'm just going to, I'm not going to show you how, where you would use these, but I want you to make sure you check this out. So, notice that there are these three different spots uh, that it can be used for. It can be used for if if you ever turn over an item, and I'm not, and, and this is, if you ever have a, like a, a test that says, that has this little blue flag, on the test itself, and the test it'll be on one of the cards or one of the locations or what have you, and it'll say they'll have this little icon, this little pictogram of this this circle. If that's the case, and you have this plus ten, it'll tell you like, oh, you succeeded. Pick up card number forty four out of that deck. But if you have this plus ten, it you get to add ten to that, and then you'd pick number card number fifty four, and that's how you unlock mysteries within the game. You you are going to have to, nearly almost always, going to have to have 
like these little pictograms come into play for you to unlock the cards that you need uh, in that deck to, to, to pull off what you're attempting to do. So, you know, you notice that, that it has that and or it can either it can be used as a minus one uh, to the cards or uh, and or, you know, and, you know, the, the two extra, you know, stars for, for being successful. And so, you know, and then also, here's a splint. It can be used to heal an injury. Notice that, you know, we have the injury, and here's the injury uh, skill right there. Uh, the injury, and it just automatically gives you three successes. In which case, you know, that's pretty huge since you need three successes to cure an injury. You know, and so that is obviously very important as well. You'll also notice that up here, one of the uh, things is actually rope. And so if you're on a spot that had bamboo and rope, you could combine those two things to make this splint. But in this case, we can only pick one of these cards, which kind of stinks. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and take the walking stick. I like the walking stick. And, and so then the other two are going to go on there. Now, we are going to go by the assumption then that we did climb this mountain. So what it does then is we're going to go ahead and we're going to dig and we're going to replace the blue, the green five, I'm sorry, with the yellow or gold five. And so as you make it to the top of the rocky hill, the ocean stretches as far as the eye can see in all directions. The volcanic island is only about a half a mile long and the resources here seem too scarce for you to survive more than a few days. So it kind of tells you, you you're kind of in a hurry here. So you flip it over it says, you notice a path to the south, apparently free of any jets of steam. You walk back down the hill, keeping in mind the most visible means of access. Immediately after revealing this, discard the terrain card you're standing on and replace it with the 29 card. And notice that this it makes it easier to walk to this location. And so we're going to go ahead and take this off, replace it with that, and then it tells us to go ahead and take that location off, dig through this deck, find number 29, and we're going to replace it. Now, notice the difference. So there's this, and like there's the different locations, like, and then remember this one? There was no path to the south. There was these steam jets over here, but now it says that we found the secret path or whatever. And so we can actually head south from this location. And so we're gonna go ahead and replace that on there. And this is what, this, I mean, this is one of those cool things about the game is that you're actually like changing the train and changing the cards that you have. And it works really, really, really well. And uh, I, you know, I just, I, anyway, I mean, I just, I really dig uh, uh, the gameplay of this. So I just, I wanna leave a little bit of a, like a, like a cliffhanger here, if you will. So. Let's say we're this character up here, and we decide we're going to go check out that dead body. And so it says, for zero cards and for zero successes, we can go ahead and find uh, card number 11. So here we go. And it says, a man lies face down among the rocks. So we'll turn this over, and there's the dead body. As you get closer, you notice that his clothes are torn to shreds in places. Some of his limbs are mutilated, and bunches of large eggs hang from his dead skin. So if you want to investigate, you go ahead and use one card, no success is needed, and you discard it, and then replace it with another card. And so, the next player can decide to go ahead and investigate that. I do want to say one thing. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to give that away or anything that will happen in that situation. I do want to say that, like, um, for example, I'm just going to go ahead and just put the number three card down here. When you decide, um, like, so if you you investigated uh, this location here, so you just go ahead and add that on there like that. When you, if you want to move, as long as it's a continuous terrain. Like blue could move to here and just pay the movement cost. You don't have to pay the movement cost for here and then the movement cost for there. You can just say, turn over one blue card and then move to that location. So, um, that's really basically how you play the game. It's a lot of cards, it's a lot of collecting things, a lot of making decisions, and you know, figuring out the secrets and figuring out the stories. I've shown you almost none of the secrets 
and like really none of the challenges. I, I wanted this to be kind of a fresh thing for when you play. But I will take, tell you a couple of things. One, um, the way you lose the game is there will be events that will just kill you. Um, I, I've had that happen when I've played it and just, you know, when I've been playing it solo. And it just says your adventure is over and you just, you're done. But um, the way that, like, the way that you can die that, that is very real and very possible is that you will get through this deck. You'll, and that's why you have food, because it allows you to take your cards and discard and put them back in the deck. But as you go through that deck, eventually what will happen is that you will uh, get through it all. And when that happens, you take all the discard, you shuffle it up, and then you put the deck back together, and then you start playing again. You keep going, but if you ever get another curse card after you've already gone through the deck once, you immediately succumb to the curses that are ravaging you, and then you immediately lose the game. You can, and that's one of the things about the game is that you can make it uh, more or less difficult uh, depending on how many curses that are in that particular deck. Uh, there's one other thing uh, that I wanted to to talk about, and I want to make sure that I have a couple of the pieces. So. Uh, two, one thing is when, it, when you see the seven over here with where those things are, sometimes you'll have an item or an event or something that'll say um, the seven is equal to like three stars or something like that. So when you see a seven, if you have an ability or an event or something that will do that, that's when that comes into play. The only time the stars over in this location over here or the sevens or whatever come into effect is when you are drawing them off of the action deck to, to try to satisfy a a, a, a a test of some sort. At no other point when these cards are in your hand or as items or anything like that does this part ever matter other than when you're drawing them from the deck. Now you'll notice that here you have aggressiveness down here on the bottom and you have aggressiveness under rudimentary flint. They kind of match up those keywords. Now remember when I told you about the inventory, how like with the three players we can have up to two pieces of inventory that are comprised of up to three cards each. As long as these have the same numbers underneath, what you can do is you can combine them together and you can add these things together. So if you had the walking stick, maybe you used it once, so the, the, the die was on number three, but you found this rudimentary flint and you go ahead and put that into there. So it was at a three, what you will do is you'll combine it, and then you will have five uses. And so you can combine those things together like so. It is very important to note that if people are working together on a certain thing, you don't all get to take an idea card. Just the person that took the action uh, gets to take it, but they can give it to the other player. Uh, the same thing goes um, for an item. If you construct an item with these abilities, you then take the item out of your hand and you put it in your items. You can't give it to somebody unless they are in the same spot as you at the time that you make it. Uh, this isn't a game where if you walk by, oh, hey, here, take my shovel or whatever. So, I mean, that is a very important aspect uh, to remember as far as like kind of like the sharing and, and what have you with the game. But there you go. Um, so basically, I, I feel bad that I can't... Uh, trust me, when you play it, you'll know when you succeed because the game will tell you. But... Um, I, I, I wish I could, but I, I, like I said, I don't want to ruin it for somebody. If you really wanted to know how it worked, I bet you could go out there and find something on the internet that would tell you exactly how this first introductory island works and what your, what your goal is and what you need to do when you're on it. But I'm not going not gonna to touch on that. Suffice it to say, it is very fun. It was very um, tough and challenging, uh, and it took me more than a few times uh, to finally figure it out. So, all right, so there, I, you should have a really good idea of how to play Seventh Continent. Uh, so why don't I tell you more about what I've really been liking about playing this one. All right, again, I apologize that I didn't really show you tons, and I'm sorry about the little spoiler, or not the spoiler, I, I'm sorry about the cliffhanger or whatever as far as with the dead body and everything like that, but I wanted you to kind of maybe feel uh, some of the wonder and, and, and mystery that I did when I played the game. I found this to be just one of those things where it was like I didn't want to stop playing, and, and I am not a solo gamer. I just, I never found... The, the the need of it. I guess it's like one of those things where it's like I want the other people at the table to interact with, to talk with, to 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 be around. But I found myself when I was playing this, especially like when I got killed, uh the first time I played it, um 
you know, I, I, I rebooted it and I started up again, you know, and, and admittedly there's a little bit of a problem there because like, you're like, oh, well I died. Well, I better not go there again or I better not do that again. But, um, I don't, I don't see that totally as a problem though, because it's one of those things where, you know, yes, you kind of learn maybe a direction, that was, but, but I, I don't want to give anything away, but one of the situations I had where I went in a certain direction and then I, I, I died. And uh, I said, well, I better not go over there and do that again. Well, it wasn't until like the third or fourth time I played after that, that I realized that if I had had an item and I had gone to the exact same spot, I wasn't going to die. And I was like kind of stuck in a, a, a dead end. And I was just like, I don't know what else to do, you know? And then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, you know, wait a minute, I got this thing and I know how I died there. Maybe that thing will help me. And so I went there and like, yeah, and so you can see what I'm talking about. So there's like, there's, there's just because you find something uh, that like, you know, kills you off and makes you reboot. It doesn't mean that, that that's like, you know, a sure death in that location. And, and yes, you might learn something from that, but it's, it's valuable knowledge, but it isn't the end all be all knowledge, if you will. So it, it's stuff like that, that, that makes me come back and makes me reboot it and makes me set up the deck again and play it again. And, and like this little introductory Island is not very big. I mean, you can play, I played through it uh, the first time just to get the rules it you know, took me a couple hours. But after that, I mean, I was rebooting it and I was playing it in about an hour or so. And, and it wasn't taking that long. And I was, and I was grabbed by it and I, and they grabbed a hold of me and I wanted to keep going and I wanted to keep playing. And this is one of those things where I said, as I was playing, I was like, man, if this like small little introductory island uh, is this interesting and this amazing, then, you know, I can't wait to see what they're going to do with like other things. You know, like when, when you succeed here, you know, you go to another setting and like, I can't wait to see what that one is and what the, what the secret is behind that situation. And then ultimately there's going to be something beyond that and something beyond that. And, and the thing is, is that the, as long as they, you know, keep having ideas, I can see them just coming out with more and more of these adventures for Seventh Continent. And I, and I really hope, I'll say this right now, I really hope they don't screw it up by adding a bunch of new rules or anything, because I think what they have here is amazing. They just need to have really, really cool, fresh contact, fresh, fresh content, fresh adventures, uh, fresh, uh, mysteries, uh, for, for me to investigate and other people to investigate as well. And I mean, I've, Never been this excited uh, to play a game. I mean, I was like coming home from work, and I was like, "Oh, as soon as I can get my kids to bed, and as soon as you know, like uh, my my wife goes to bed, then I can go down to my game room and I can play Seventh Continent by myself again." And I mean, I haven't felt that way about a solo game, and I don't know when. You know, so uh, if you're a solo gamer, I think you're going to absolutely uh, love this. Uh, if you are a a uh, person that likes exploration games, if you like uh, adventure games, if you like those old fighting fantasy books, I think this is a must-have. Um, they are blasting through the the uh, the pledge levels, and and they they funded on Kickstarter, and it looks like it's just going to be a runaway hit. So um, I backed it. I can't wait uh, to get all the exclusive content and everything else. So um, I mean, I think this is going to be like one of those cool one of a kind games that uh, you know um, obviously has been in the brainchild of the designers for quite some time. And uh, I think it's just going to keep paying off dividends uh, as the game as it goes on. Um, I, like I said, this is this is uh, one of the most fun times I've had playing a game all year. And I mean, I literally have I'm guessing like one tenth of the game maybe uh, <laughs> in front of me. And and I and I had an absolute blast uh, every single time that I played. So. Uh, Giant recommendations to anybody that is looking for something unique, something fun, and uh, something mysterious and 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 engaging, uh, and and fully immersive as far as uh, the adventure, uh, like game or or, or adventure uh, a story, uh, game goes. So there you go. Um, that is uh, Seventh Continent. I can't recommend it enough. If you have any questions about the gameplay, please ask away. I'll be happy to answer those to the best of my ability. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. And as always, I am the Undead Viking, and I am telling you to have yourself one heck of an awesome day. All right, bye-bye.